Let us pray. Deepen our desire for you and awaken us with your truth, God. Open our minds and our hearts to your word for us, that hearing we might believe and believing trust you with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. After Thomas read today's scripture, he said, the word of God for the people of God. We may have reluctantly or hesitantly said, thanks be to God. After all, the scripture today portrays Jesus as not being what many of us consider very Jesus-like. I can't remember where I read it, but I have read that if we were to choose the top 10 most difficult passages in the gospels to understand, Today's scripture would definitely make the top 10. It might even make the top five. Because of this, today's sermon is a bit different in its style than on most Sundays. I'm going to walk through the scripture section by section. In other words, I'm going to do exegesis and then application of the scripture. Hopefully, it will help us understand it a bit better. You still might come away from it saying, I don't know what in the world this passage means, but I'm going to make an attempt at getting at the meaning of it. Jesus begins by saying, I came to bring fire to the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Strong language. We can turn to the book of Malachi in the Bible though to help us understand what Jesus had in mind. Fire in Malachi and in other places in the Bible refers to purifying. To purify means to cleanse or to make new. Jesus can make us into new people, in other words. I have two questions that I'm going to ask again in a sermon in the not too distant future. The first question is this, how is your life different because of Jesus? How is my life different because of Jesus? Closely related to this is, how would your life be different if Jesus weren't part of your life? I ask myself the same question. Jesus said he wanted to bring newness to our lives. But why does Jesus seem so urgent in our reading today? He says, how I wish it were already kindled. We might get an answer if we look at the words that follow these words in our reading today. Jesus says, I have a baptism with which to be baptized. This baptism to which Jesus is referring is his death. Remember that these words from chapter 12 are part of what are called a travel narrative in Luke. It begins in chapter 9, verse 51, where it says that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. It concludes in chapter 19, verse 28 of Luke, where it also says that Jesus was headed to Jerusalem. So all the chapters and all the verses in this travel narrative are in the context of Jesus headed to Jerusalem where he's going to die. At the outset of his life, or even at the outset of his ministry, I don't think Jesus knew that he was going to be put to death. But the more that he preached and taught and lived to set the oppressed free, the more likely it became that the powers would be would put him to death, and Jesus began to see the handwriting on the wall. This is what he had in mind when he said, I have a baptism with which to be baptized. As I said in the statement about baptism, Jesus is referring to his death. Words from the 10th chapter of Mark help us understand this. Here's what Mark says. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what is it you want me to do for you? And they said, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. 
But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am going to be baptized? In other words, are you willing to face the kind of death that I'm about to face? Getting back to the question, why does Jesus seem so urgent in this passage? It's because Jesus began to see that his death was on the horizon. When a person knows that they are about to die, it makes things seem a little more urgent. And this is the case with Jesus in this passage. Then Jesus says, what stress I am under until I see that it happens. A better word than stress would be constraint. What constraint I am under to see that it happens. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am steadfastly committed to my mission of seeing that the reign of God comes closer. I'm constrained to do it. Jesus thought if the reign of God comes closer, then justice will prevail. But it also means that it will probably lead to my death. Then comes, which probably jumped out at you, the especially difficult part of today's reading. Jesus says, do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. In the first chapter of Luke, we are told that Jesus will guide our feet in the way of peace. In the closing chapter of Luke, Jesus appears to the disciples after resurrection and says, peace be with you. So at the outset of the Gospel of Luke and at the conclusion of the Gospel of Luke and in many places in between, we read of a Jesus who was a peacemaker. It's not just in Luke that we read of Jesus being this way. Each of the Gospels proclaim, proclaims Jesus this way. For instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. In chapter 11 of Matthew, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you peace. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Jesus is quoted as saying, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Jesus who embodied peace and preached peace, that's the kind of Jesus that I like. But then we have these words from today's gospel reading. I did not come to bring peace, but division. Is this the same person who lived and spoke of peace? Is he Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Maybe Jesus really didn't say this. That's the easy way out of today's reading. It is true that Jesus didn't have the gospel writers traveling around with him with a chisel and stone tablet record, recording word for word what he said. His words were passed along by word of mouth for decades before they were recorded. Luke, for example, was written 50 or so years after Jesus lived and died. For this reason, some of what Jesus said inevitably changed. But Luke never intended for his gospel to be a word for word record of what Jesus said. He was not writing a biography, but it still leaves us a bit perplexed with Jesus' words today. Jesus may be using hyperbole to get his point across, which he often does in the Gospels. In other words, he overstates the case to make his point. So his words are not intended to be taken literally, but they are intended to be taken seriously. They are vastly different than the words I mentioned from the other places in the Gospels. But instead of seeing the words as contradicting each other, perhaps we would realize that Jesus was complex like all human beings. 
We are all walking contradictions as he was. Church historian Martin Marty has said, you can expect me to be consistent, just not all at the same time. Jesus was no different. Still, what do we do with these words about division? One thing that can help us understand it is the Semitic perspective on results and purpose. The way Luke phrases it, as we heard, it sounds as if Jesus were saying, I purposely came to divide families and others. But he did not intend to do that. Instead, his words and his life resulted in division. But Jesus didn't purposely come to divide. Jesus' life and message can cause division between people, even between family members. What Luke describes is result, not purpose. In other words, Jesus did not set out to create division, but divisions were inevitable given Jesus' message. When Jesus shows up, justice prevails, and some don't like it. The message of Jesus sometimes hit head on against unjust systems. And this can cause division between those who benefit from the unjust systems and those who oppose them. Now we need to be careful about identifying ourselves as being right and others wrong. That's why it's important to listen to each other and recognize the fact that we just might be wrong. The key is whether or not we proclaim and live, if we do, is it consistent with love of God and love of neighbor. Our passage today concludes with more strong words. Jesus refers to people as being hypocrites who are able to predict the weather, but who do not know how to interpret the present time. One of the participants in this last Monday's Bible study but it's something like this. Jesus was telling his hearers and he would tell us that we are responsible for seeing the work of God among us. The ways that love and compassion and justice are appearing among us and we are to link our lives with these causes. And the participant said, we have the capacity to make a positive difference in the world. There is enough knowledge and expertise to transform the world. This is our call. Let's follow.